Thank you very much for watching these videos on understanding God's book as we apply the eight interpretation rules to uh, various passages to see how they, how they work in application. And so with this video, we are going to look at Luke chapter six, Luke chapter six. Luke chapter 6, verses 37 through 38, has Jesus teaching about judging, condemning, forgiving, and giving. And so it's a development of practical righteousness would be how I would title this passage. Luke chapter 6, verses 37 through 38. And we're going to apply the eight rules, the Holy Spirit, definition, usage, context, historical background, logic, genre, judgment, and divine inspiration. Rule number one, very important. It's dependence on prayer and dependence on God must be at the forefront of all Bible study. We've got access to the divine author. So we begin the process of Bible reading, Bible studying, and Bible interpretation with prayer to God, asking for assistance. Teach us the meaning of your word. Write it on our minds and write it on our hearts. Let us pray that we will learn much about Luke chapter 6 and apply it to our lives. The second rule is the rule of definition. Define the meaning of a word from the original language. What word, words, or phrases needs to be defined for clear understanding? Well, when I look at this passage of Luke chapter 6, verses 37 through 38, I think judge, condemn, and forgive strike me as key verbs that a clear definition would add to my understanding. I think we have a handle on the command give, right? If I, if I just pick three instead of four words, judge, condemn, and forgive. So let's look at the first one, judge. Well, the Strong's Concordance number, if you Google the Strong's Concordance number, is 2919. And according to BibleHub.com, it says this, quote, It means I judge whether in a law court or privately, sometimes with a cognate nouns emphasizing the notion of the verb and b i decide or i think it good unquote from bible hub how about helps word study mentions a reference to picking out or choosing by separating this word judge is used in the new testament 115 times in luke chapter 6 it is a present active imperative a command so let's focus on definition on the present imperative verb in the New Testament, the continual commands. So that's in Romans chapter 14, verse 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, and Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. So Romans chapter 14, verse 3 talks about diet choices. And the NIV says this, quote, The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge. That's that number 2919, present active imperative. Must not judge the one who does, for he has accepted them, end quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, speaks more broadly about judging others, saying, quote, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, quote, Therefore, judge, present active imperative command, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God, end quote. And then Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, talks about food and days, saying, quote, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to the religious festivals, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day, unquote. That adds a lot to the word judge. Now let's look at the word condemn. 
The Strong's concordance number is 2613. And condemn means to judge or condemn in an exact and personal manner that is highly specific. It means to condemn or pass judgment upon them. It's used six times. Matthew chapter 12, verse 7. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. And Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Acts chapter 25, verse 15. James chapter 5, verse 6. And Acts 25, 15 says this in the NIV. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. That's the noun with an implied verb, unquote. Acts chapter 25, verse 15. So this verse is about Felix, the governor, and Paul's imprisonment. James chapter 5, verse 6 condemns the wealthy, saying, quote, You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Now that word condemned is an heiress active indicative instead of a command. Isn't that interesting? You can learn a lot about that word, huh? How about the word forgive? Strong's number, Strong's concordance number 630. The force of this verb is to release, to let go, to send away, to depart, Right? Isn't that cool? It means to loose or release. Isn't that an interesting picture of forgiveness? It occurs 68 times and can be translated as divorced or pardoned or sent away. As in Matthew chapter 18, verse 27. Also in Luke chapter 6, verse 37, it means to release a debtor, not to press one's claim against him. Metaphorically, it's about pardon another his offense against you. It's about pardoning. Isn't that cool? Let's look at the next um, rule of usage. Study the word, phrase, or concept used in its cross-referencing on the historical, physical, and cultural setting. What word, phrase, or concept needs to be checked against historical, physical, or cultural settings to add an understanding of the passage? I think the phrase good measure is a weird phrase. And so I want to study good measure and its usage. A good measure is cross-referenced with Mark chapter 4, verse 24. Mark chapter 4, verse 24. And in one of my study Bibles, it has a very interesting footnote. The NIV Cultural Background Study Bible um, says this on page 1693. Jesus uses the language of the marketplace where grain or other substances would be weighed out for a certain amount of money and would need to be weighed out fairly. Some Jewish texts apply the image of God's justice as the last judgment. Isn't that interesting? So it's about being honest and fair and correct, this good measure. So it's like a butcher weighing bacon for sale. What are the implications? If we are harsh and critical in our judgment and condemnation, God will also be? That's something to think about, right? The fourth rule is the rule of context. Everything must be understood and interpreted by context. What is the context and how does it add to a clear understanding? The paragraph, the chapter, the book. Well, it's in the middle of a sermon. These verses are right smack dab in the middle of a sermon. Jesus is addressing his disciples according to Luke chapter 6, verse 20. He's teaching about blessings and woes and loving your enemies before this passage. After this paragraph, Jesus teaches about actions, that actions reveal character and making wise, godly decisions in lifestyle obedience to God's word. So how does not judging, condemning, and forgiving come into that? Well, Luke chapter 6, verses 37 through 42 contains three paragraphs about developing practical righteousness. And we are only focused in on the first paragraph. 
practical righteousness. So paragraph number two is about the blind leading the blind. And paragraph number three is about unfair and overly harsh judgment on your brother. This context puts the four commands and the good measure reference in its proper voice. It's about practical righteousness. The fifth rule is historical background. This is understanding the text from the human author's culture, time, and perspective without contaminating it with our modern culture, time, and perspective. We want to understand what Luke is trying to say to his original audience without muddying it up with our own uh, modern stuff. So what historical element in the text could be studied for clearer understanding? Well, I think in these two verses, Judging others and justice, judging others and justice in a historical context may add for a sharper understanding, right? So I found another footnote in the, in the same NIV cultural background Bible uh, study book. So uh, the study Bible. In the study Bible on page 1758, it says this. I'm just quoting it. Quote, in principle, many Jewish rabbis and even some Greek thinkers would have agreed with Jesus. Sirach 28 verses 1 through 3 as a cross reference for Jewish rabbis. Nevertheless, not all people practice what these sages taught. And even today, following Jesus in practice requires more than agreeing with him in principle. End quote. Isn't that interesting? So the whole judging others in justice has kind of a larger context of Jewish rabbis and Greek thinkers. And it's not so much understanding the principle as it is practicing it. I can, uh, I can work on that, right? The sixth rule is one of logic or inference. What does, the interp does the interpretation make sense and what is the passage teaching? Well, I think Luke chapter 6, verses 37 through 38 is teaching the four commands. The four commands are obviously the center of the point of the passage. In context, how does not judging, condemning, forgiving, and good measure fit in with loving enemies and living in obedience to God's word? I think it teaches a, a truth we all know and experience. We are harsher on others and their garbage than we are on ourselves. We judge them harshly, and then we cut ourselves a break with understanding. This passage rebukes that dichotomy. Let us forgive and understand others as we dedicate ourselves to a lifestyle of obedience, as good trees producing good fruit, and builds our lives on the bedrock of Jesus and God's word. That's a very good logical interpretation of this passage, I think. The seventh rule, genre judgment. Genre types contain their own interpretation subrules. So what type of genre is this text? And how should that type influence the understanding? Well, this is a sermon. So sermon genre. Its common characteristics are long monologues like the whole book of Deuteronomy or Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 sermons. The context should point out the spoken nature of the text and the grammar and vocabulary must reinforce it. Its specific rules are a flow of thought, life principles for application, interpretations within older passages, attention to commands and prohibitions, well, that applies to the way this passage talks, and examine any uh, slipped-in figurative language like metaphors, similes, parables, or humor, and treat them accordingly. Most everything in the sermon genre should be taken at face value, very logical and common. So I think we should Emphasize the four commands and take it at va face value. Very logical and very common. I think we're doing that. I think we're being safe. The genre is sermon. <laughs> the eighth rule is divine inspiration. We are to be committed to seek any explanation for any errors that are in the text. Does the passage contain any errors? 
What are some possible explanations for these errors? Well, the Old Testament and the New Testament teaches to judge actions as sinful, evil, and wicked. I mean, look at Psalm 37, verse 30. Psalm 119, verse 13. Proverbs 31, verse 9. So the Bible teaches to judge one another for accountability and toward godliness, right? John chapter 7, verse 24 says, Stop judging by mere appearance, but instead judge correctly. And first. Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 14 and 15 and 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 15 says the same thing. So do not judge and condemn can't be in contradiction to the, those ideas. So is there an error? Is there a contradiction? No, no, not at all, not at all. The text is clearly cross-referenced in Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 through 5. So with the surrounding paragraphs of Luke chapter 6, not judging and condemning goes with forgiving, not being blind, and not judging harshly our brothers and sisters. So it would be wrong to apply it as a shield against accountability and godly standards. We are not supposed to harshly judge and condemn. We are not. Our attitude is supposed to be about forgiveness. But we still are supposed to hold people accountable to godly standards. Hold one another, iron sharpening iron. Absolutely. To what ends? So what? What about Luke chapter 6 verses 37 through 38? How does that fulfill 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, and the teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training? Where's the application, in other words? The point is to do it. In the Greek, four clear commands are found in these sentences. Don't judge. Don't condemn. Do forgive. And do give. Who are you judging and condemning? Whom do you need to forgive? What is God asking you to give? Are you easy with yourself and harsh with others? These are the things we need to chew on as far as life application of this passage. May it condemn us and teach us and train us.